All right. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. So were you familiar at all with the three body problem books before you joined the show? I confess I what I'm 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 not a huge sci-fi person, but most of my mates are. So when I mentioned this job to them, they were, they were like geeking out over it. Um, so I realized, oh, this is hot property. So then I read the books before meeting with David, Dan and Alex. Yeah. But I'm ashamed to say it wasn't on my reading list before then. And what were your initial impressions of the book when you were when you were reading them? I mean, blown away. I was blown away by the books and the concepts. And again, I confess that I, <laughs> I'm not the most scientifically minded person. So uh, it took me a while. I had to reread certain things. But my goodness, the abstract and the visuals that that were portrayed in the book were just mind blowing and a gift really to any visual artist of any medium. Yeah. And um, in terms of approaching to the episodes that you were going to direct for the series, did you have any initial discussions with the showrunners, Benioff, Weiss and Alexander Rue on how they wanted the episodes to also be approached? I mean, what's complicated about the three episodes that I did, well, let's just dive into Judgment Day for a second, because many of, <laughs> many of the concepts and many of the big set pieces are not grounded in any form of reality. A lot of the science-based world both from Wade's perspective or the Sophon and the Santi's perspective, uh, a very ethereal and very high concept. So there's nothing tangible to get to, to, to kind of bite onto. So really you're starting with a blank canvas. And it was interesting. So when I was speaking to David, Dan and Alex, and we started riffing off each other about the Sophon sequence or the nanofiber sequence. What I very quickly realized was the best way forward was to, to really sit down with a storyboard artist in the first instance and just kind of mind meld with this wonderful French storyboard artist, Stefan, and, and just to, to, in a way, brainstorm these weird, wonderful, fantastical ideas. It's a bit like animation everything is available to you. You're not limited like you are on a normal drama. So that was exciting um, and, and really liberating for me as a director. And so, yeah, I, I, I then pitched those to David and Dan and Alex. And then from there, the conversations continued. But for example, as I say, a, a lot of these storylines are so abstract that we had to really be careful to make sure that the audience could keep up with it or or stay with it because it took me like five reads plus to kind of get my head around it so I wanted to make sure that this was a tangible um concept for example with the invisible fibers how do you explain that these are incredibly powerful fibers I know we set it up earlier on in the season but there's nothing to really process or understand how these two poles are winched up across the, the the Panama Canal. And, you know, I had copious meetings with the um, science advisor, a wonderful guy called Matt, who was at McKenzie, who was really good at sort of making, explaining it in layman's terms. So in that respect, I would add a few things to the equation. So for example, I put divers into the canal so that we could understand that there was something going on underneath the water that maybe we wouldn't, you know, we were nodding to something big happening. Yeah. And uh, you directed also episode four, uh, which contains one of the show's most uh, <laughs> shocking reveals, in my opinion, in which uh, UNG is revealed to be the leader of this, <laughs> I guess, cult movement that will help the yeah. Santi take over Earth. And it's especially shocking for Jin Chang because she has a very close connection to her, as we see in the first episode after Vera's death. 
uh, but it kind of makes sense because she's the one that gave her the, the video game in the, the first episode. And um, I previously spoke to Jess also uh, on the on the show, and she she sort of explained that, that specific moment uh, became far more personal than she initially thought when attempting to uncover uh, what the Santi wanted. And I'm wondering if you if you can talk about how you sort of wanted to play that reveal, not only for the show but also for for Jin. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting because on paper it possibly wasn't reading as personal and then when I was rehearsing and thinking about it more and understanding the the impact that the old EA Wenji had had on on Jin's character and all those Oxford Five growing up I wanted to make that betrayal feel even more gut-wrenching so the way I blocked it and the way I sort of directed Jess was to amplify how personal um, that felt and, and, and the betrayal that came with it. Also, it's amazing for the audience to have this shocking moment. So, you know, initially, if I'm, you know, all, 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 all full transparency, um, she, the announcer didn't say Ye Wenge. He just said our commander, and we changed that in post because we felt it would it would hit a bigger punch if we actually name checked her in that moment as well. So that was also something that we amplified, and I was also very particular about the camera work in that moment. So I'd I'd held back. I'd been on big wides. I'd been long lensy, but I actually went in with the steady and went with Ye Wenji. And, and that moment. And I also sort of like added a little touch of Tatiana watching and feeling a little bit jealous of that of that moment. You know, I was just like, you know, rubbing it all in while I could. And then there's also a shootout that happens right after. Oh. And it's fairly disorienting, the camera work. And uh, I'm wondering how extensive was, I guess, the planning, preparation to film that scene? If there was also this, this approach that you wanted to take? Well... On, on paper, it was called, the location was called the Equestrian Centre. Like, it, it was just this, again, like David, Dan and Alex were just constantly throwing these sort of abstract things at me, like, what is an Equestrian Centre? We weren't going to be in the stables. So really, and because the Sante is actually a very wealthy cult, like they've got all the money in the world. And because there's a lot of technology involved, I spoke a lot and brainstormed with Deb Riley, our production designer, to come up with an idea of what could, because, you know, it was, it was it sort of described as a cocktail party, which then, you know, everything goes tits up. But I was like, you know, what, what, where can we stage this? And then I thought there's something really cool. I mean, it's quite 80s, 90s. But, you know, when I was at art school, there was this real thing of, um, video installations and I was talking to Deb and like brainstorming and saying why don't we sort of like lean into the technology side of the Sonti and the, and the video game but not the video game but the fact that they're so progressive with that and then we spoke to the titles guys uh, that were doing our title sequence about creating a sequence and then what was fun for me was you could have front projections back projections so that started to inform how I was going to shoot this and how I was going to light this you know for Martin it was quite complicated because if we lit it too much it would burn out the images on the screens but on the other hand um, you know our, our key cast needed to be lit so it was a, it was a really interesting set of equations to get this uh available and and in check and 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 crisp and charismatic and and hopefully um visually stimulating as the sequence yeah and you briefly talked about the the judgment day scene uh in episode five which uh is i don't think we've seen that before i think from a purely technological standpoint on television like this it, it, it seemed like a pretty ambitious sequence and i did talk to also the visual effects team they were also tell, telling how complex it was to sort of pull it all together. I'm wondering, I wonder if you talk about a little bit like how that sequence was specifically shot in your collaboration with the VFX department also. So so on something like something as big as Judgment Day, um, and of course, 
one had to break it down because originally we had planned on actually getting an oil tanker and shooting a lot of it on the top of it and in some of the corridors. But with COVID, it was an impossible uh uh, it was impossible. So we ended up really having, we called it postage stamps. So we designed the top deck of Judgment Day oil tanker with these spaces, which VFX were then drawing together. Uh, but it was important to me, for example, that we had children in the sequence, not to see them massacred, but to just nod to the audience what was about to remind the audience that this was a community and that they didn't look like freaks they were just all normal people so we injected a sequence in the canteen all of this was built but what was vital to me was to emotionally engage in this moment before we then um get to the massacre um <laughs> which was a minefield because i sort of added more work for myself, but I think in a way it paid off by integrating SFX as much as we could in camera and then amplifying it with the wonderful work that VFX did. So you had this, hopefully, this, this visual and uh, mind-blowing sequence for the audience, but there was enough tangible stuff that it didn't feel CG. You know, of course, they had to scan bodies in order to do the slicing. But, you know, we had magnets. We went down to basics. There were tables. You know, every 50 centimeters had to be spliced. We, you know, off camera, it was just as dramatic as on camera because we had like 20 pairs of hands, like pulling stuff or triggering magnets so that lights would fall and pictures would fall and tables would fall apart. So it was a, it took something like five, zero, 50 minutes to reset each time. So it was quite a quite a task. I mean, it is a truly remarkable sequence when you when you watch it oh. happen. It's very, very, very good. Thank you. Um, okay. so, were, were there any other challenges also um, that episode specifically, there's a lot of big visual effects heavy sequence. There's a scene with, in which uh, Jin and Wade go back into the video game. They speak into the Sofon and then, you know, the Sofon tells her basically of, you know, their plans for Earth. I'm wondering if there were any sort of challenges in sort of capturing the visual look of that particular scene. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, let's just say COVID was one of them, um, which was the added challenge beyond what we were already dealing with. But, you know, we took over Piccadilly Circus, which I guess for the US is like taking over Times Square. It had never, it, apart from Tom Cruise, very few people had ever managed to, 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 to secure that location. And we had it for a finite amount of time between Saturday night, Sunday morning. So you can imagine, you know, London's a pretty um, eclectic but but party city. So Saturday night, we were getting the, you know, the 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 the, the remainder of people falling out of nightclubs and whatever coming through Piccadilly Circus. So we had all of that to deal with while we were trying to set up this huge scene. And then when you think about the sequence of the Sophon and when you are bugs comes up on the screens. What I think was our biggest challenge was that the light pollution of the video wall onto all our extras and our characters when we were then saying that the sky was covered by a curtain. So we couldn't have bright lights. So we had to pray with the sun and we weren't allowed big silks on the um, on Piccadilly Circus premises, and we could only have the crane for a certain amount of time. So some of the sequences had to be rethought because we also had some people who came down with COVID. So we had to sort of like shoot it in a different way than we had originally anticipated. So there, are, you know, I look at that sequence and I go, "Wow!" But I also go, "Oh, it could have, you know, it, it, certain shots I couldn't do because of the technical." side of it but also the logistics but it was it was a really interesting challenge for myself and Martin the DP because when we were in the on sea stage at Shepparton we designed an entire almost light show that was off camera but it was basically lighting the artists the cast according to what was going to then be put on a in post in VFX so there's nothing worse than feeling like it's an afterthought so we were very meticulous about 
what was a journey when they were looking up at the sky and the flashes coming from the the fleet as they were engraving um, uh, computer circuit chips onto the sofons. So it was creating flashes on their faces. So if we looked up and we saw flashes, but nothing happened on their face, it would feel sort of uh, a, a job badly done. So, so there was a constant dance between what we did in camera versus what, so it's all the time being in contact with VFX to make sure that we were all on the same page. And you've got this really great final shot too, as Tatiana looks at the eye in the sky, smiling in awe. Everyone else feels powerless, but she's like, she's, you know, she's finally seeing the Santi being revealed to the world. I wonder if we can talk about that, that specific shot, that specific moment. Yeah, yeah it's it, it's like World War Three, and there she is, this lunatic, suddenly like the only one that's just... Anyway, two things to really tell about that moment. One is, it was the first ever shot I did. And I knew how important it was. It was my first shot, you know, I was double, I was block shooting. So I was doing eps four, five, six. So, and, and to have to do episode, like that first shot of Tatiana, you know, it wasn't ideal, but you know, just got to throw yourself in the deep end. And I remember also thinking about charting, when did we last see Marlo, the, the Tatiana character? So this idea of starting on her injured foot to remind ourselves of where we last saw her. But you know, that, that gave added challenges to the VFX department because you know, they said, can you do a static shot? I said, yeah, that'd be really boring. What about if we went, you know, down, we went with the foot, we came up to her. Uh, and, you know, in the end, they kind of understood my vision for it and went for it. And that, that was all fab. But when I then turned to Tatiana, she's got this unbelievably beautiful face and these glass blue eyes. And as a non-blue eyed person, but having worked with a few other uh artists with blue eyes, I know how sensitive they are to, to light. And there was I asking her to look up at the sky um, and she was getting watery eyes. I already wanted it to get emotional, <laughs> but I actually wasn't expecting it to go that far. But she was like, Mick, I, I am trying to hold it. I said, no, this is all fab, but it was partly because her eyes were. But I wanted her to have this very impactful, heartfelt relief that the Santi were giving her a sign that they were back, that they were gonna take care of her while the rest of the audience and all our key members were absolutely petrified of, of, of what was at stake now. So episodes four and five have these very ambitious uh, sequences. Uh, episode six is, I think, far more intimate in this exploration of the character relationships, especially when it comes to Will. Uh, he shares some really poignant moments with uh, with Saul on the beach and also Jim, of course, as they make paper boats. And then Will, at some point, decides to buy the star. I mean, that's how the episode ends. He decides to buy the star for, for Jim to sort of profess that he still loves her. And going back to my interview with Jess as well, she, you know, she said that she, you know, she believes that, you know, Will still has feelings for her. And Will has always been sort of Jim's safe space. But the two never really sort of acknowledged the true feelings that they had for one another until it was too late in the seventh episode. I'm wondering if you can talk about, you know, working with, with Jess, Alex, and also Javon and sort of, you know, building that relationship and expanding that for the, for the sixth episode. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm probably best known till now as being a character um, centric, you know, performance is, is so paramount to me and, and, and character development. So, it, this was an exciting project for me. And also I got the best of both worlds. I got to do the big the big set pieces, but also actually uh, since episode one, what we realized was the cast hadn't actually um, had a lot of scenes together. They weren't scene partners. They were like two together, but as a group, it was really lovely to actually reunite the cast and for them too, to just spend a bit of time all together. Um, look, it, 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 it was an incredibly emotional journey that I wanted to start to touch upon that would be paying off in episode seven and eight. Um, and, you know, in, in, in real life, Alex, the actor that, who plays Will, was also going on a very dramatic diet to lose a ton of weight 
to 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 support his storyline. Um, and so I I talked to all of them individually, but then also together. And sometimes I would give a note to Jess, and I wouldn't let Alex know what I was telling her because, you know, people can get too safe in a space and in a scene, and this wasn't an easy conversation to have. So sometimes it was really interesting to give a note to Jess that I knew was going to surprise Alex as an actor, but also Will, the character, that was going to keep it fresh. And then, the, you know, the, 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 the same with, 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 with Jovan and, and Alex, who, were, who really worked well, that they, the, the three worked well off each other in, 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 in these scenes, but it was about constantly making these scenes feel authentic and true and truthful. Um, Alex did a lot of research about uh, death and preparing yourself for death. But I wanted us to also understand what it's like for best friends to deal with losing somebody at such a such a young age. Um, that you know, <laughs> setting the boats, the origami boats into the the sea uh, off the English Channel was a challenge. But uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, writers sit in a room and they create these wonderful scenes. But the truth is, it's not always easy to pull it off. But yeah, we um, we had the the camera team in wetsuits and all sorts of other things going on to try and get those shots, um, but also not disturb the actors with their performance. I think that's also you know always key. But you know what, with that and the wind, it was like howling. And anyway, it was it all turned out well. <laughs> Yeah. And is there is there something that you would say was the most rewarding aspect for you as a director in working on the show? I mean, working on such a a beloved piece of IP and being able to work hand in hand with David, Dan and Alex was an utter gift. And then the icing on the cake for me was to be able to really you know, the, the pressure was on. Judgment Day was everything. It was what was going to catapult us into the final back end of the season. I knew everything was gearing up to it. So that episode five was such a pivotal moment in the show for many reasons. And to have the honour of being gifted that episode uh, and being given that, you know, the, the responsibility was was really something special. Um, and I felt honored that David, Dan and Alex felt trusted me to to deliver on that kind of level. So that was that was pretty amazing. Awesome. Well, uh, it was really great talking today, uh, Minky, on three body problem. Congratulations. Episodes four, five and six are my favorite of my, my favorite of the show. They're just fantastic. I remember just watching episode four. My jaw was on the floor with that reveal. And then the Judgment Day sequence. I mean, my God, it was so good. <laughs> oh, but I really appreciate hearing that. Thank you. Well, uh, I wish you all the best on your future projects. Season two and three were also confirmed uh, not long ago. That's always very exciting. And I hope that you have a very good uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.